Hello, and welcome to our next class of the Plain Gospel and what we're supposed to do with it. My name is Curtis Hartshorn, and I want to encourage you to get out your workbook if you have that, and more importantly, if you can get a Bible in front of you, if there's any way for you to do that, it would be most beneficial to you. You can be opening that to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll be there in just a moment. Each of these classes, as I was designing and trying to think of the best way to present to you the, the gospel and share with you the things I've learned over the past few years about the gospel, what I did was every class except for that first one we did and the last one we're going to do is going to focus on a New Testament book. And each of these books is chosen because it contains a predominant theme as it relates to the gospel. So we've already done Mark, the Gospel of Mark, and we've done Acts, and we've done Romans. Now, in this class, we're going to do 1 Corinthians. And the predominant theme of this one is 1 Corinthians has the core of the Gospel, as we're going to see. Uh, the first and most important thing about the Gospel is recorded in 1 Corinthians. So I'm excited about getting the chance to share that with you. There's three main points that we're going to be talking about. The first one is I want to show you the relationship building gospel. You know, when you're studying the, the gospel with somebody, it's amazing how close you can get to each other, how, how it promotes good relationships. And we're going to see that in some of these early passages uh, the first point that we want to make under this, number one, is our evangelistic goal is not to baptize people. It's to preach the plain gospel. As Paul is opening up the book uh, that we call 1 Corinthians, and he's writing to the church in Corinth, and they are dividing. There is division in the church, and it is over, of all the silly things, who had baptized who? And so you're starting to get these clicks in the church, and you had your little Apollos click over here, and your little Cephas click, and your little Paul click. And, and Paul is writing to them, saying, what are you doing? Is Christ divided? Were you, were you crucified by Paul? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? And so on the heels of that, let's, let's look at verse 14 together. It says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. So that no one would say, you were baptized in my name. Now I did baptize the household of Stephanus, and beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized any others. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. Paul can't even remember who all he baptized. Yeah, I baptized them, them, oh, and them, them. I don't know who I baptize. That's not the goal. The goal is not to baptize people. And I think there's a message there for us as well. Sometimes we make that the goal. Get people in the water. Get them baptized. I know baptism is necessary to salvation. I understand that. But the goal is to proclaim the gospel to people. Not, and the goal is, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, to go make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the goal is to make disciples, people who are going to follow Christ, not just people who are going to get wet. Uh, our responsibility is to preach the gospel. Now, number two, the gospel doesn't need our cleverness. And when we do, that empties the cross of its power. That's why we're calling this course the plain gospel. We don't need to spice it up. We don't need to put ornaments on it and, and make it frilly. Just teach the gospel just the way it is in the Bible. As Paul says there in verse 17, it says, Our goal is to preach the gospel not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. We don't need to improve upon the gospel because we can't improve upon the gospel. It's perfect just the way it is. Third thing that we're going to learn in this next passage is the gospel made Paul a spiritual father to the Corinthians. In chapter 4, and starting in verse 14, I did not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. 
For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Now what Paul was talking about was he, through his gospel, was able to help participate in their rebirth, in their coming into the kingdom through spiritual birth. In other words, he taught them the gospel and they got baptized. And that made them, in a sense, a spiritual father. Now, they didn't call him father, but he was like a father to them. They looked up to him as a father figure. It created a tight bond between these Corinthians that he was so close to and himself, where they, they had the type of relationship where he could speak to them fairly boldly about some things that needed to be changed. He could chastise them as a father or reprimand them or correct them because he had that type of relationship. And that's what the gospel does. It builds strong relationships. Second thing that we, we want to look at as far as uh, the aspect of the gospel is be ensuring the gospel's future. 1 Corinthians really brings this out. The need to make sure that we continue to do things that are going to help the, go help the gospel do well in the future. And the first one, number one, is do all you can not to hinder the gospel. So we turn to chapter 9, and we'll start in verse 11. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? Now, what he's talking about there is if a person is, is preaching the gospel and is doing that full time, like that's what they're doing for a living, then there's nothing wrong with them reaping a material benefit from that. He'll talk more about that here in just a moment. Verse 12 says, If others share the right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. And so Paul sets a precedence here that we should all follow. We don't want to do anything at all that hinders the gospel of Christ. As we think about our lives, the way we're living, the example we're setting for others, we certainly don't want to do anything in our lifestyle or in our words and the way we treat people that would hinder the gospel of of Christ. And it does hurt our message if we come to church and we're little angels there, but all during the week we are mean to people or we are hard to get along with. Uh, we're unkind in our dealings with people at work or as we're in the community going to the grocery store, the gas station, wherever. You need to think about your example and are you doing something that hinders the gospel of Christ? We don't want to do anything at all to hinder the gospel of Christ. And Paul says, I didn't even use my right in receiving financial support because I, I didn't want to hold back the gospel in some way. He, uh, he must have uh, believed that maybe they were not able to support him financially or, or whatever the situation was. But he said, I didn't use that because I, I would endure anything. I'll endure all things rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Now, talking a little bit more about receiving support, number two, those who preach the gospels are well within their right to earn a living from the gospel. He says this in verse 13. He says, do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple? And he's talking about the old covenant. This would be the priest and even the Levitical tribe, those who even who weren't priests, received some financial help, some support so they could serve in the temple. And he's drawing that Old Testament principle into the New Testament. And those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar. And so, again, Old Testament. Verse 14. So also the Lord directed, now the Lord would be Jesus, He directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. So the worker is worth his keep. I've been preaching in the Church of Christ for about 40 years now, and I receive a salary for doing that, and I have for the past 40 years, essentially. And so and had I not received that, I would not be able to study as much. I would not be able to reach out 
in the community and have Bible studies with people and do counseling and do many of the things that I do because I would have to be providing for my family. My drawing a salary has allowed me to do many things and I'm, I'm grateful to God. I love what I do, by the way. Absolutely love being a minister with the Church of Christ. It is to me the greatest lifestyle I could have ever chosen. No regrets whatsoever. That is an option for somebody. Now Paul says, I didn't use that option in the situation there in Corinth, but it is not, there's nothing wrong with a person receiving a salary for preaching the gospel. That helps to ensure the gospel's future because we have in congregations where there is a full-time minister or in some cases a full-time elder I've even seen or, or uh, uh, different people like that. If, if somebody is able to devote their life full-time to something, then they can pay attention better on a day-to-day -day basis to what's going on, whereas with a lot of times we just see things kind of week to week when we come together on Sunday maybe, and oh, well, this needs to be fixed, or, or we're not doing enough of this, or we need to grow on that. If somebody is paid full-time to pay attention to that, that ensures the future of the gospel. That helps to move the gospel forward. A third thing that ensures the gospel is number three, he mentions woe to any believer who does not preach the plain gospel. And so there is a responsibility not just for ministers, but for anybody to preach the gospel who has received the gospel. Going on in chapter 9 and verse 15, just the next verse here, it says, But I have used none of these things, and I am not writing these things, so that it will be done in my case. He's not saying I'm not trying to raise a support here. For it would be better for me to die than to have any man make my boast an empty one. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For I'm under compulsion, for woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. The way Paul felt about it is if, if I have this gospel, this good news about salvation, and I don't share it with somebody, uh, woe is me. That is so wrong that I, I wouldn't be eager to, to tell others this good news, this, this path to salvation that I've been blessed to find. Uh, that should be the natural response. And of course, the more we do that, the more we ensure the gospel. We also make sure that we are teaching the correct gospel. Let me share another scripture. I'll put this up on the screen here for you. 2 Corinthians 11, 4 says, For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we've not preached, or you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. And I hope you can hear Paul's sarcasm in that. They shouldn't be bearing it beautifully. They should be objecting. A different gospel? A different spirit? A different Jesus is being preached? That should never happen. There is one Christ. There is one Spirit. There is only one gospel. I'll talk a little bit more about that in another class, but make note of that. There really is only one gospel. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, also put this one up here, it says, because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God by your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. Notice the obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ. He's writing to the church. He's not writing to preachers or, or elders or apostles. He's writing to the church saying, I commend you for your obedience to the confession of the gospel. You see, it is the responsibility of every member, not just the leaders in the congregation, but every member to ensure the future of the gospel. Got a couple more things I want to say about that. Number four, preachers may choose to forfeit their right to earn a living from the gospel. He says this in verse 17, he says, For if I do this voluntarily, I have reward, but if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer it the gospel without charge so as not to make full use of my right 
in the gospel. And by the way, I don't know if you noticed this, but starting in verse 12 down through verse 18, eight times he mentions the gospel. I mean, it's obvious that this is a, an important theme as he is uh, talking to the church there in Corinth. A preacher can receive a salary for preaching the gospel, but he also has the right to say, I don't need that, and I, I, I know of situations like that. I'm not in that situation, but I know of some that have become independently wealthy through some other means, and they're able to say, you know, I don't, I don't need to, to get a salary, but I'll go ahead and keep preaching the gospel. And amen, that's, that is great to see that. And that's what Paul is saying. He was in a situation, I don't know if he was making tents or, or he had support from another congregation, but he was able to present the gospel to them free of charge. It actually made him a little nervous, though, because in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, this verse in verse 7 says, Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge. And there he's kind of questioning, well, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Uh, the, the disadvantage would be maybe if they were helping to support him, they would maybe care more about what he was doing. And so he's just, uh, he's just saying, I, I hope I didn't wrong you in not uh, receiving support from you. All right, uh, another point here on ensuring the gospel's future. Number five, everything we do as a church and as individuals is for the gospel's sake. Now, this is a very important point. We're going to skip down a few verses. Look down at verse 22. We're still in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Paul says, I do all things for the sake of the gospel. That means as individuals or as a church, every single thing we do should be for the sake of the gospel. If it's not for the sake of the gospel, why are we doing it? We have to be careful sometimes as a church that we don't get to doing a lot of activities and forget the reason we're doing these things is to present the gospel to people. Now, there's nothing wrong with ice cream socials and potlucks and uh, some of those kind, kind of things that we do. Uh, that's, that's fine, you know, but, but why are we doing those things? Hopefully, it's to provide opportunities to invite unbelievers to come and see that, that Christians enjoy life and, and come in and get to know them a little better. Everything that we do needs to have the purpose of the gospel behind it. I say that because we do sometimes get church members who think the church is just a social club. That's not what we exist for. We are the Lord's organism. I don't want to say organization. We're, we're a living Thing. The church is a living thing, and our purpose is to make sure the gospel is passed on to the next generation, that the gospel continues to thrive and flourish as it has for 2,000 years. We want to ensure the gospel's future. Last point, point C, a reminder of the gospel. There is a specific gospel on which we stand. And this is really the core verse here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 1. If you'll read that with me. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which you also stand, by which you are also saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now this really is the core of the Gospel. Uh, Paul had already taught the gospel to them, and now he is reminding them of the gospel. 
And he says, point number two here, the gospel saves us under the condition that we hold firmly to it. You see that in verse two? By, this gospel is going to save you if, if you hold firmly, if you don't compromise it. What I'm teaching you about the gospel comes straight from the Bible. Don't change it. Don't alter it in any way. Don't, don't let somebody come along and say, oh, well, yeah, that, but this is just as good. No. Hold fast to the gospel. Don't let it ever be changed. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, let me put this up here for you. It says, that, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. If we're not careful, the God of this age comes along and He blinds us, so we don't see the gospel. We need to make sure that we hold fast to the gospel. Don't let anybody change it. Don't let anybody come along and say, well, we can improve upon this. No, we want to hold fast to the plain saving gospel. Point three under this. The gospel is that Jesus died, he was buried, and he was raised. Now that's what verse three and four says. For I delivered to you as of first importance. Now, as I've already stated, the gospel covers a lot. It covers the whole life of Christ and the good news about why he came to this earth and what he came to do. But at the core, the first most important thing is Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now that is the hub of the gospel, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. When we get to our last class, we're going to come back to this verse and, and really unwrap this more. There's, there's a, a prize waiting for you there, and so when we get back, we'll, we'll unwrap it a little bit more. But keep this in your mind. The first most important thing about the gospel is Jesus died, He was buried, and He was raised. One last thing before we leave this passage. I want you to notice... Not once, but twice, he mentions the scriptures. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, the end of verse 3. He was buried and raised on the third day according to the scriptures. What scriptures is he talking about? Well, he's not talking about Romans. Romans wasn't written yet. The scriptures that he is referring to is the Old Testament scripture. This is the word graphe, which I, I mentioned a couple of classes ago. Graphe means only inspired writing. And the only inspired writing that was really in a hole at this point was, or, or complete at this point, was what we call the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant talks about the Messiah coming and what he was coming to do. And he says, we're seeing the fulfillment of this Old Testament. This has been around for a long time. This has been planned. And now Paul says, we have it. We're so blessed to have the gospel, and we have the core of the gospel. In our next class, we're going to turn to Galatians, and we're going to look at when the gospel is not the gospel. Really hope to see you then.